Okay, uh, welcome to session four. Um, glad you all made it from three to four. I know the, the walk was real long, so appreciate you making that. Um, hopefully you're all geared up. Um, our next speaker, um, you, are, you are in for a treat here. Um, but also just wanted to uh, take a minute to say a reminder to take the summit survey at the end. We're trying to get as many responses as we can and learn as we go here. Uh, this is the first uh, virtual summit we've ever done. So I'm sure you'll have some feedback and comments on how we can keep making these better and better for you uh, for you as attendees. So uh, please fill out that survey at the end. Um, our next speaker is my very good friend, Greg Wukash. Greg for 20 years has worked for the, has worked in the external affairs department with the San Antonio Water Systems or SAWS. Um, beginning as an education coordinator and now as the external affairs manager. When not talking H2O, this professed water nerd also geeks out on strategic planning and organizational culture discussions and loves hanging out with his wife of 26 years, his three children, and his two grandchildren. Um, in addition to his work with SAWS, Greg has also worked as an environmental educator with Aquarina, Center in San Marcos, Texas, as the Corporate Training Development Coordinator for Six Flags Company, and as an adjunct professor at St. Philip's College in San Antonio for 14 years. Uh, get ready to hear my favorite preacher, Greg Lukash. Take it away, Greg. Wow, well, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> and for those of you who may know me, uh, you know that I am not going to be able to sit still. Uh, I am going to have to stand up and, and, and move around. I hope that's okay. I hope you can sort of track with, with me on that today. Uh, I want to uh, thank you so much for allowing me to, to be here today and uh, I'm just really honored. I, I have to Though I have to say, though, real fast, that quote earlier, water is only worth it because people are worth it. Um, wow, that like set the tone for me today. And, uh, and I was really glad to hear that because I'm going to be able to connect a little bit about that to uh, the presentation today. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is indeed Greg Wukash, and I am with the San Antonio Water System. Uh, and to be honest with you, uh, I am a certifiable water nerd. Uh, if you want to advance to the next slide, I'll show you that I am a certifiable water nerd. I am not uh, embarrassed to say that. I'm going to own it right here, right now. And my guess is, is that I'm probably not alone. In fact, I'm pretty sure that I'm in great company here today. Uh, my fellow water nerds, I do. I get fired up by sharing stories uh, with those around me. And, you know, words like MGD and desalination and aquifer storage and recovery, they, they flow right off my tongue. I'm sure they flow off many of your tongues. Uh, but we forget sometimes that our neighbors and our communities just have really no idea what we're talking about. This is literally a foreign language to most of them. And as much as I hate to say this to you today, I think it's vital that we embrace this really important reality here today. We must realize that yes, we are water nerds. We are ner water nerds, but they aren't water nerds yet. And I emphasize the word yet because that's one of my personal professional goals to convert as many of my San Antonio neighbors into water nerds as I possibly can. <laughs> but if I'm honest, if we're really honest, one of the things that many of us who sort of drink this, we live this, we breathe this every single day, we have a hard time remembering. And this is what we have a hard time remembering. That in our water nerdness, we sometimes mistakenly believe that everyone in the world is as excited about water and our water projects as we are. Okay, I'm sorry. I know, I know, I'm sorry. I know y'all are saying right now, Greg, stop the lies, stop it. Stop saying this to me. This is how you look, right? Some of you are saying that right now, but here's the deal. If you're married, you already know this. I mean, you know, you're working on that project you're really excited about, you come home to your spouse, you want to tell them all about the project you're working on, and you, you start talking about it and talking about it, and then you get that look, and you know exactly the look that I'm talking about, like they just kind of tuned out. Now, the fact of the matter is, and I think we need to embrace this, is that most people don't really care about how much water we can store in an ASR or the types of membranes that we're using in a desalination plant or how we're tracking water loss across the communities. 
I've asked my suburban neighbors, I've talked to my wife, I've had discussions with my children about this, but we can't take it so personal. See, it's just that it's that it's, it's all the noise and there's a lot of noise. One of my present day uh, favorite writers, Seth Godin, you can see it right there, says it this way, you're trying to get through all the noise and the distraction and the clutter with your message. But here's the thing, you are the noise and the distraction and the clutter. And just because it's important to you doesn't mean it's important to us. It is, of course, in the eye of the beholder. And instead of creating a campaign that somehow cuts and invades, consider creating a product, a service, and a story that we'd miss if we couldn't find it. Okay, so then how do we do that, right? I mean, we've, we've heard some really great stuff here today, and I'm really glad to hear that the, that the thread has been consistent. How do we tell a story so captivating that is actually able to cut through or get above the noise? How do we get our community something that they can't afford to miss? In fact, I'm going to say it this way. What if, what if every person in your community believed that water was the most important resource and that your organization was the most important organization in your community? Now, I know some of you have slight grins on your faces. If you've been in this business for a long time, you're thinking, okay, sure, right, Greg. I've been doing this for 23 years. Um, and it probably popped in your head. You said something like, yes, Greg, but. And I will say, ah, oh, there's that big old but once again. I also bet, though, at some time in your career, you believe that this could actually be possible. It may even be why you got into the water business to begin with. See, it always tends to be our butt that gets in the way of us believing that we can tell a great story. And by the way, for the record, I actually do believe that we work in the most important industry, delivering the most important product to our community. And I know that some people say that that sounds very arrogant, but I really do believe, I actually do believe that I work for the most important company, the most important organization in San Antonio. And if that's the case, and if I really believe that, and I do, then why wouldn't I want to share that story with a community that I love so much? So to help us unpack the idea of sharing a great story today, I'm going to talk about these issues. Okay, the first one, I'm going to discuss the evolution of storytelling by looking at the ancient Greeks to see how their storytelling style differed from the modern day trends. We're going to also look at the second point. We're going to break down the components of stories by disassembling a current story in the media to understand how all the parts are connected to the whole. We're going to, part three, look at how modern day English and 18th century Russian contributed to the art of telling stories. Four, we're going to explore the 23 vital parts that make up an important story. Five, we're going to learn how to use emotion in interpretation. Six, See why using dactylic hexameter is the key to telling effective stories. Oh, absolutely. And seven, we're going to compare and contrast the meaning of boring and engaging. All right. Don't worry if by point three, you started planning your dinner for tonight, or you started squirming a little bit in your seat, and you're starting to think to yourself, I have a couple emails that I need to answer right now while this joker's rambling on about some 18th century Russian Ready for a quick kick in the gut? Because this is my job. Part of my job is to kick you in the gut a little bit today. See, this is how many of your audience members may feel when you're presenting to them at that community meeting. Yikes. In fact, take a look at this. This is what your point-by-point -point presentation agenda and topic of discussion may actually really look like to them. Because if your presentation, and we just heard this, if your presentation is filled with acronyms like ASR or MS4, it might look like noise. If you're using terms that took you four to five years to learn in university, it may sound like noise. And if you were trying to fit in every topic you possibly can into a 30-minute homeowner meeting, noise. Now, we may go to a meeting to discuss the latest project, even give a tour to a local group of Girl Scouts, and we feel that everybody needs to know all the facts, all the statistics, all the points, everything from A to Z, everything from AA to <clears throat> right? And so we end up putting together 76 slides. Why? Because that's how we like to learn things in our water nerdness. But I wanna remember that they aren't water nerds yet. So as we share solid water stories with our neighbors, 
and what we do. Let's not forget, and we've said this today, I've heard a couple speakers say this today, it's excellent, that the goal is not more information. The goal is transformation, not just remembering, but responding. But how do we tell then stories that we get people to respond? Well, I think it's really about piquing their interest and inciting their curiosity. And to begin with, we have to acknowledge where most people are starting from, and then we have to create a process to get them to lean in a little, to hear above the noise. We must craft a story to meet them where they are, not try to move them to where we are. Now, many of us have been here, right? We've been in this, this same spot. Some of y'all right now are looking at this picture going, oh man, I wish I was there right now. Uh, sun goes down, maybe the air temperature is a little cool. Each of us grabs something nice to drink, a marshmallow, a stick, and we huddle around that campfire. And people begin to share stories that hopefully keep us spellbound of trips, adventures, and memories. I love doing that. I love doing this with, with my friends. Typically, it involves, a, I'm just going to say it involves a good cigar. Or I actually smoke a pipe. So it involves kind of sitting around that fire and we just start to tell stories. Why? Because story is so powerful. From the beginning, when story was first told on cave walls to Greek and Roman mythology to the grand narratives of the Bible to Shakespeare to even the silent movies and television, storytelling has been used as a powerful mechanism for connecting humanity. And even in today's complex communications world, there is still room, plenty of room, to rekindle the lost art of telling stories. So when you want to translate the concepts of brackish desalination facility to a group of suburban stay-at-home moms, you look to your storytellers. Now, I know this idea isn't new to us. In fact, storytelling has been a central discussion topic in the water communication sector for a long time now. That's what we're having a discussion about today. But here's my question to you. Who is telling the water story in your community and how well are they doing? How well are they doing? And who's actually telling the story? All right, so you're saying, all right, Greg, I get it. Storytelling is important. Been hearing that all day today. Can you please get to the title now of your presentation and tell us how to build an effective storytelling team? Now, listen, I could easily do this by telling you all about my team and how we've done it and all the steps and all those kinds of things, the practical way. That would be great. But um, it would leave out really the most important thing, which is the foundation. And what I'm going to talk about for the remainder of my time is probably not going to be anything new to you. You're going to say, wow, this is not like revolutionary anything. It's going to be a great reminder, though. I'm a pretty basic guy, and I believe in a focus on basic principles. And I believe that good stories first come by remembering three important foundational principles, not revolutionary, but three foundational principles, your why, your what, and your how. And by the way, I forgot to, to, to tell you earlier that I love metaphors. I use a lot of imagery uh, when I'm thinking through concepts. So I'm going to throw some at you right now. You see, the, the why, what, and how are the, th are the three true foundational principles with which your storytelling team needs to be assembled from. So let's just break these down in the time that I have. And let's start by looking at our why, our why. We can go ahead and advance to that next screen. I think that the most epic stories, and I don't know if you agree with this, but the epic stories begin with the phrase, once upon a time. In other words, sometime in the past, long ago, or at the beginning of the story. The beginning of the story, our once upon a time, is our why. Why do we want to do what we want to do? Why are we currently doing what we're doing and why is it so important to tell that particular story and i think that many of us who try to tell stories we don't start by answering our why or remembering our why we begin somewhere in the middle if you could back up on the on the screen just real quick we begin somewhere in the middle of the story by trying to address the what or the how and that's actually why a lot of our neighbors lose us in the first few minutes of our presentation because we have failed to begin at once upon a time the great why guy, <laughs> Simon Sinek, you've probably seen him on, uh, on YouTube, uh, said in a TED Talk a number of years ago that people don't buy uh, what you do, they buy why you do it. And I absolutely agree with that. Very important. You, you want to get people to move from information to transformation, 
to truly respond to your message, tell them why. Give them your once upon a time. And here's the next kick in the gut. If you and your team don't even understand your own why, then how in the world are you going to share it with anybody else? In fact, when we don't understand our why and instead begin in a place of what or how, we can actually quickly lose our way. And I know this from personal experience. So let me show you how I know this from personal experience. Uh, if we can flip to the next screen, I'll, I'll show you how this, this works. So I was an educator for the public water utility in San Antonio, Texas, with the primary mission of teaching drinking water issues and wastewater treatment processes to school kids. But I was invited to a local uh, environmental conference. And after my presentation, a member of the audience thought I spoke well enough to invite me to attend their grassland and ecology symposium and speak on the connection between water and grasslands, which interests me, by the way, but I am absolutely no expert at it at all. Great opportunity, right? Well, maybe, because you see, after I spoke at that event, a member of the audience presented me with a flyer and asked if I could set up a booth at their upcoming Native Prairie Festival, which, of course, I said yes to. I agreed to do because, you know, that's what we do. We say yes almost all the time. <laughs> now, in fact, my activity at the festival was so well received that an employee of the local land management group, they emailed me later to ask if I might be interested in partnering in a five-week grass planting and invasive plant removal initiative, which I was very excited about participating in, and so I did. So think about it for just a quick second, right? I'm a water utility educator now participating in a grass planting and plant removal initiative on company time, part of it on company time. I got lost because I didn't really understand or I'd forgotten about my why. And as one of my leadership heroes, Patrick Lincioni says, if your why is wrong, your how is not gonna matter. All right, so hopefully we have that, that ingrained in us. Let's, let's move on to the what then, your what. So after you identify or remember your why, you move on to the what. What is it that you're trying to accomplish? And at the end of the day, what are we trying to produce or create? Now, as we are crafting our stories, we have to have a clear understanding of what we are hoping to come away with, or better yet, what they, our neighbors, will come away with. And our team needs to understand that what. It's hard for most people to stop doing stuff long enough for them to identify why they are busy doing and then what they are actually accomplishing. So let me give you an example of this. And some of y'all, if, if you've seen me talk before, this is something I, I always talk about because I think it's so important, but you're a tire manufacturer. You've been doing this for eight years. You've been working in a successful tire manufacturing company, but you're at the corporate office eight years. You love making tires. It's a, it's a great accomplishment. You get fired up and every day, thousands of good, safe, reliable tires are being produced to help serve the consumer. But one morning, for whatever reason, you decide that you're going to go down to the factory because you want to actually see those tires coming off the, 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 the factory floor, coming off the production line. So you show up, you drive down to the factory, you show up early one morning only to discover that you actually are not producing tires at all, but instead are turning out tennis shoes. All that hard work, day after day, eight years, to produce something that you weren't expecting to see come off the assembly line. Now, imagine that you go to your boss to find out the reason why it is that y'all switched from producing tires to producing tennis shoes, and she becomes infuriated, and she looks at you, and she says, hey, wait a minute, we should not be actually making uh, uh, tennis shoes. We should be making rubber trash cans. Rubber trash cans at a tire factory that is actually producing tennis shoes. Now, what's my point here? See, many of us in our places of work may be functioning in much the same way as this factory, because each day, Hundreds of us, dedicated water employees, arrive at our jobs to clean wastewater, test water samples, host community meetings, design pipe systems, not even truly understanding what all of these raw materials are actually going to be used for, what the final product will be. And if asked, some are going to believe, you can go ahead and put up the first bullet there for me, some might believe they are creating tires, some might say that they were assembling tennis shoes, and some might explain they are manufacturing trash cans. And the reality is, if we don't even know what we're trying to produce, how in the world can we expect any viable outcome? And how can we even tell the story about that outcome? You see, just because a group of people has a bunch of boards, hammers, and nails 
does not mean they're building a house or anything recognizable. This is a quote by Lori Beth Jones. Some leaders think they are doing their job because there's a lot of hammering going on. Some of you are probably nodding your heads right now going, yeah, been there, done that. All right, so how about the final one, your how? How about your how? How about your how? We finally come to this how moment. And uh, to be honest with you, uh, there are many, many great ways to tell the stories within your community. You can go ahead and advance the slide for me, please. And we're hearing about that today. We're hearing about the how. We're hearing about some great ways to, to tell stories in your community. And this topic is really almost endless. But I have decided to share with you just for the last few minutes that I have my personal ethos and how to get this done. Now, probably the most important thing I personally believe and, I, and I'd like to get across is that I think we need to go to where our neighbors are gathered instead of expecting them to come to us. And then when you get to them, be ready to tell a story that gets under their skin. I hope this is not too politically incorrect right now. I, I understand with COVID going on, but this is my best analogy that I have uh, to explain it. Uh, we need to tell a story that gets under their skin. What does that mean? Three points here. One that they can catch. Again, I know, totally politically incorrect. One that they can catch. It's not too difficult for it to get into and get on our neighbors. They've got to be able to catch the story. Uh, the second point is one that they cannot ignore. It's got to be compelling enough for them to remember it. And the third one, one that they can spread. It's got to be plain enough for them to share neighbor to neighbor, friend to friend. So we got to tell a story that gets under their skin when we go to where they are. That's the first point. The second point, we have to give them a story that stands out from the rest. You can go ahead and advance the slide. We have to give them a story that stands out from the rest. We have to give them one that is real um, we can't make up a story to sort of embellish our points. We need to give them one that is relevant. I heard somebody say this a while ago. It's absolutely true. A story that's relevant is why should they care about this? How does this actually affect them in their home and their day to day? And then we also need to give them a story, one that is well thought out. We need to give one that we've actually thought through and, and we've planned way in advance. My final point here, my third point is this. We have to do all of this with authenticity. The first point is we have to be truthful and we have to be honest. We have to share even the dirty parts, the things that sometimes we don't want to talk about, maybe things in our past that we don't think we should bring up. We need to bring up. We need to be honest. We need to be truthful. We need to be bold. We can't fear controversial subject matter. And the last one I would say is we've got to own this story. It's always better if you've actually lived it yourself. So let me wrap up with this. Let me just wrap up with this. I know I'm just about out of time, if not already out of time, but there was a Tuesday evening a number of years ago, and I found myself setting up a computer um, and a projector at a local public library here in my city, right? We were in the beginning of a rates campaign, as a, as a lot of y'all have been involved with, and um, they needed me to go out, set up the projector, and be there to, to kind of host the very first campaign of the entire year. And as the doors opened to this library that we were at, an older woman had been waiting patiently. She made her way into the room. She took a seat on the front row, and she looked really familiar to me. I'm pretty good about remembering faces, but I absolutely didn't remember her name. Uh, but I couldn't quite place where I'd seen her before. And, and as I shook her hand and welcomed her to the event, she said, it's really good to see you again, Greg. You can advance the slide for me, please. She said, it's really good to see you again, Greg. Now, this didn't completely take me aback because, after all, I had met her before. Uh, but before I could probe further, she reminded me that we had indeed met a year before on our monthly Rain to Drain tour. This is a public tour we do for, for everybody to introduce them to the, to the system. It's a free tour. And I said, well, excellent. Did you enjoy the tour was of my natural follow-up. And she said, absolutely. She was nodding her head. But what she was about to say next blew me away, stopped me dead in my tracks because she said, Greg, I just want to let you know that I'm here at this meeting tonight to help defend you, the San Antonio water system, and to tell anyone who has a problem with your rate increase that they need to shut up and see all the good work that the San Antonio water system is doing in our community. I'm here to tell them that they should be proud of our water system like I am. Now, honestly, how often does that really happen? Let me just say it's never happened to me before. It's usually the opposite. <laughs> we usually enter the room bracing ourselves for the onslaught of negative feedback, criticism, harsh language. I was stunned. But here's my point that I really want to get across to you uh, at the very end here, the crux of my time with you today. When they begin telling your story, 
you've won. When your neighbors begin telling your story, when they have become your ambassadors, you've won. You've moved them from transformation, not remembering, but responding. And how is it possible? Yeah, let's just go to the summary real fast because I am completely out of time. First of all, don't assume everyone loves your story as much as you do. They are not water nerds yet. And the goal of a great story shouldn't be more transforma uh, information, but rather transformation, not remembering, but responding. And storytellers must know their once upon a time, their why. And storytellers need to know if they are talking about tires, tennis shoes, or trash cans, their what. And storytellers should tell stories that get under their skin, that stand out from the rest, and that are authentic. And you can just pop that summary up there for me real fast. And I'm going to move on to the last slide. Because the last one is when your public is telling your story for you, you have actually won the day. Please hear me. I'm not claiming to be a storytelling guru. The distinguished panel of storytellers that we're here with today are infinitely more qualified on this subject matter than I am. But I do know what I've, I've experienced. I do know what I've engaged with. I've seen work in our community. I've seen work with our team and my neighbors. And I wanna leave you with this final thought from Seth Godin that I think encapsulates so well the essence of what we've been talking about here today, that our goal isn't to touch everyone. Our goal is to touch someone, to change someone, just one person. And if you get good at that, do five, then do a hundred, but stop worrying about everyone. Everyone doesn't matter. Can people in your community come to believe that water is the most important resource and that your organization is the most important organization? I think so. And I think that that one older woman attending a Tuesday night rates presentation would say the same thing. When your community becomes your storytellers, hey, you've won the day. Thanks so much for having me, letting me speak, and I've enjoyed our time together. Sorry for running over, Stephen. <laughs> no, you're great, Greg. Uh, I think everybody could probably see why you're my why you're my favorite preacher these days. So <laughs> I appreciate you. Thank you for being here. Uh, we did get a couple of questions, so uh, we have uh, two minutes here for them. So I'll ask them: um, What programs have been successful at meeting your community? Um, and uh, if you could explain that in sort of the why, how, what model, that'd be great. Yeah, well, uh, real quick, we designed, I mentioned this rain to drain. Uh, we do a, a field trip for our community uh, once a month, absolutely free. We put 50 people on the bus every month and we take them uh, from the beginning of where our aquifer uh, originates from the, from the ground to a pump station, to our, you know, to uh, a, our aquifer storage and recovery facility, and then ultimately to a wastewater treatment plant. We sat and crafted that story. We, we spent a lot of time and putting the elements and crafting that story together to create an experience for them uh, because they need to see it. They need to see what they're paid for and what they're invested in. And uh, you have people, this is my favorite thing. People show up on the day and a lot of times they're like this, mm -hmm, San Antonio water system. Yeah, okay, whatever, whatever. And by the end of the day, I am not joking. Uh, by five o'clock at the end of the day, they will come off the bus. And I've literally had people walk up to me, give me a giant hug and say, wow, I had no idea that this is what uh, y'all did and what it's all about. And so that's the greatest feeling in the world for sure. Awesome, I'd give you a hug too, Greg. Um, <laughs> Uh, what is one communication mistake you think most utilities are making? I, well, and it's going to come back to a basic thing for me. And, and Stephen, you know this, uh, it's, it's why. I think a lot of times we don't really take the time to stop and think about why we're doing what we're doing and really craft out our communication message and, and our story. We just jump into things or things jump onto us. We're so busy putting out fires a lot of the time that we don't have any time to actually be proactive in planning stories. I think that's the big mistake. And so my team and I, we carve out significant amounts of time to sit what we call a, around our round table. We literally have a round table and we do this round tabling exercise where we sit and talk about, okay, what is the story going to, going to, going to tell. Uh, and that's, for, that's everything. I even believe like, I'll give you a quick example. The background that I have here is part of me sharing the story today. I don't have time to get into that, but it is. And so I even believe your backgrounds, I believe your props, I believe everything has to be well-crafted in order to tell a, a great story, especially in today's culture. Awesome. Hey, thank you, Greg. And we're going to head over to our last session. Obviously my story says I like beer. So uh, I will see you all in the closing remarks.